is the 11 Dubcast. I'm Johnny. He's George. It's hate week. It's time to beat Michigan. We're going to talk about all of that stuff. We're going to get super into it. Oh, my God. I'm jacked. I'm juiced. 365 days, man. I'm I'm frothing with anticipation. It's a rabid Wolverine. (laughs) Which... You know, if the Wolverine has rabies, uh, you a rabid Wolverine that needs to be put down. Exactly. Brutally. That's right. And it's been since 2019, man. Like, that's the thing that really blows my mind. It's not like, yeah, you've lost three games in a row and that sucks and, and you're angry about it. You want to rectify it. But you were also cheated out of a win in 2020. And it's it's been three since wins. just. Yeah. And it's been since Justin Fields, that Ohio State won. So this is a long time coming. Uh, Michigan has it coming. We're going to talk about that in detail. And in fact, we're going to kind of hit fast forward on a lot of the stuff that we normally do, just so that we can kind of revel in our anger and hate. We um, know what the people want. Yeah, well, and really, that's what a good person would do, is to just let it consume them until it just fully like is, is pouring out of their vein. You know, just like, that's really what you want. I mean, that's um, how we've both made it to 11 Warriors, is it not? Is that we've, that, we've allowed, we've thrived on our hate for so long of this that's school true. that it powers us as as writers and opinion yeah. shapers of the Ohio State football fandom. The the it's hamster not, that, if that's running if, on the creaky uh, wheel in my brain is, is powered entirely by just the haterade for, for if that If you are door. doing this out of love, you are in it for the wrong reason. That's right. We do this because we hate that team up north. Yes. That well, much. And, and so, you know, obviously Ohio State versus Michigan is is a big part of that. But, you know, the Big Ten at large, like I hate all of these guys. I don't like any of them. I wish them all the worst. I, I'm amused all the by time. some of them. I'm not, well, I'm not here, quite that far into it. Right. But here's if my I point. If I was, I wouldn't be able to especially reserve a special amount of hate for <laughs> that team up north. <laughs> yeah. The only thing that I would say, and we'll get to this a little bit later, we're not the SEC. This is not a mutual admiration society. And I'm just glad that we have a rivalry that allows us to wallow in our own crapulence as much as we really would like to uh, and, and, and take them down a peg. So I'm excited about that. We'll talk yeah, about unlike that Unlike the folks down south, we're not too big on incestuous relationships. That's so. right. Exactly. Exactly. Um We'll talk about the SEC later. Let's start with Indiana, Ohio State, uh, a top five opponent. Hmm. Brian Day, two and one against top five no, opponents. Doesn't doesn't count. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't count. count. No. Mm, sorry. Yeah, it is. It is the they, they never. They've never been there before. It's the same thing as Penn State. It's like, What's yeah, that? they're top five. But I mean, you know, it's a James Franklin team. That's right. It doesn't a, count. Doesn't yeah. really count. Um, Ohio State came out. They they were sluggish. Had another kind of slow start to the game. Uh, they re- they only had one full drive in the first quarter. They were about halfway. Well, they were about two thirds of the way through their second drive when the first quarter ended. Um, but really, just didn't get a whole hell of a lot going. And then special teams stepped up. Obviously, you've got um, you know you've got an incredible uh, blocked kick and all this other stuff. Uh, third quarter starts with not even a block kick. I guess it was just a fumble on the part of, uh, yeah, of Indiana. No, I mean, that's key is that it's, it's an unforced error. It, like, yeah. It was, was an unforced error. The, right. The funny, the funny part was I was asking the beat, like, is it like, is it raining badly at the game? And they didn't really respond. Cause you know, I mean, they're busy, go figure. But then right. you chimed in in the same thread and you were like, I live like three miles from the stadium and it's not raining up here like at all. Yeah. yeah. But it was, but the it, sky cams at the game are like visibly soaked. Yeah. So it's I, like <laughs> how much of an impact is the moisture really having on the product? And then shortly afterwards, we all see Indiana commit the biggest blunder of the game that ends up yeah. totally turning the momentum in Ohio state's favor, which was crazy. Cause that second quarter was just like back and forth, back and forth, like just whiplash with momentum and who was going to have it and take over the game. And I think yeah, it was like both learned... teams were saying, no, we want you to win this. Game. Yeah, that's no, right. No, 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 please. You, you, after you, after you, yeah. um, the, the truth is though, is that Indiana had really only one drive of note. I mean, you could talk maybe the garbage time drive that, you know, basically everybody was asleep for. I don't think that no, ru- running the ball that much when you're down 31 yeah. seven. No, that, that didn't matter. Right. Signet, I mean, Signetti, when he uh, punted after, like he considered it on fourth down, took a timeout and then punted anyway, that's a white flag. That's basically saying 
you know, please keep this close so we don't look bad. Um, and I, well, I guess it wasn't my point... just that because I like I worked the game this weekend, sure, so yeah. I covered Signetti's post game press conference, and he flat out admitted in the post game presser, he said. Every time we drop back to throw, something bad happened. Right. So not <laughs> right. wanting to put, I mean, that's verbatim what he said. And so, he's and he's not wrong. He's completely, like Curtis Rourke had eight completions on 18 attempts, and that's right. it. So so maybe Joey Galloway was onto something last week while the entire country was throwing him under the bus for saying right. that Indiana should hold Curtis Rourke out of the Ohio State game. <laughs> but... Uh-huh. To, but when you are operating under that mentality that, okay, we just straight up cannot throw the ball at all, right? you, you basically are just trying to expedite the, the game and get to the end and get yeah. out of there, which right. is something I understand having been in a situation in high school where we were down to like our third or fourth string quarterback and the guy had literally completed more passes to the other team than our own receiver sign. That's and always it was the something end of the season. you want to see. And it was like, yeah, we want to get out of here. And it was the same thing I, I pointed out when Wisconsin played Alabama earlier this year and they lost uh, Van Dyke, I believe was the mm-hmm. name, the guy that transferred from Miami. And then they were back to uh, Braylon. I'm forgetting what his name is. Bray, Bray, I don't know. It did not... Uh, the guy that played against Ohio state last year and was not very good, uh, or maybe it was two years ago. I don't even know at this point, but the point is Wisconsin <laughs> was down by like three scores already. They lost their starting quarterback. And at that point it's like, okay, we can't throw. Let's just right. get out of here. Running clock. Let's get the hell out of yeah, here. So Signetti was in the same, he recognized his team was in the same position and wanting to live to fight another day said, you know what, instead of trying to throw ourselves back into this game, Let's just narrow the margin of victory for Ohio State so it doesn't look as bad like right. when people are reflecting on this game many moons from now and they're thinking about us for a college football playoff spot and we'll live to fight another day. So right. I can understand where he was coming from with respect to that at least. Yeah, and and I you know, and I think you know, Indiana, I guess my overall point that I was kind of making here is that yes, the game was close going into halftime, but I think you could also kind of tell which team had the better athletes, right? And and I didn't have any after that first drive, you know, where it looked like, okay, Indiana, this is for real. After that, they did basically nothing. The, the rest of the game, like that was it. They had the one scripted drive. And then after that, it was just Jim Knowles, you know, putting Indiana in a box. And so I don't, you know, I was never concerned about this game after that. I know there were a lot of people who were losing their minds in the first maybe quarter and a half of the game, which is, I, you know, understandable to an extent. Ohio State wasn't performing. Oh, the, the, site, the site crashed after the first drive while <laughs> right. I was trying to write news, which was right. pretty funny. Right. It got um, back up pretty quick, but I was still like, no, no, it went down. I, I know it did. <laughs> um. But anyway, my point is, is that Ohio State had the dogs and, and Indiana didn't. And that, you know, kind of bore out in the second half. And, you know, you get look, it was, again, a still a top five win. You get a punt return for a touchdown, the first one in literally a decade. I actually was present for the last one, uh, also against Indiana, um, also at home. And uh, that was at, under interesting circumstances, too, because that was, you know, in 2014, the national championship year. Ohio State was also stayed home that day. Well, a lot of people did because we had tickets and we're like, well, hell, we got to go to this, you know, freaking game because we got tickets and, you know, I don't, I don't have student tickets. I can't just go to any game. The Jalen Marshall game. Yeah. So Jalen Marshall is the guy who had the punt return for the touchdown. But what people forget about it is it was like 38 degrees. There was ice everywhere. The, The stadium was only about half full because people were having such trouble getting in like 315 all these other roads were closed there were multiple accidents um and you know the team didn't look that great to start with either and then he was the spark plug so no, he you know, scored you got, like four touchdowns in the span of like nine minutes or yeah, something it, it was, was wild absurd. and and so you have a similar situation where caleb downs you know kind of electrifies everybody with a punt return for 79 yards and a touchdown and uh after that it was pretty much like all right let's let's score some points and then ohio state just did that so you know this is not a game that I particularly want to dwell on too much. I, I think we can talk a little bit about the offensive line. Uh, Will Howard played really well, I think. Um, you know, he had an interception, but I don't really, I don't know that I would really want to put that on him. I mean, he, 
he threw it. it kind the of guy tip, had it in his hands. It was like a tip. Yeah, it was like a tip yeah. pass ordeal. So yeah, it it's like, not something know. that I think he can take a lot of uh, heat for. Um, you know, the offensive line PFF, which I generally turn my nose up at, uh, did not grade the offensive line very well, but they did grade them well in pass protection, uh, not in so much in, in you know run blocking. Um, you know, and, and the running game wasn't super elite like you would like to see but they didn't really need it to be. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't take a whole lot from this game, but I certainly don't take anything negative, I guess is what I would the, say. This game reminds me of two different games that happened earlier this season, one recent, one not as recent. Um, but it's very funny to me how similar this game was to the Northwestern game, mm-hmm. especially because up until the two garbage time scores at the end, it was 31 seven, which was the final score of the Northwestern game. Right. But the first score of the game was Ohio state's opponent on the first drive. Northwestern fumbled the ball away on their first drive. But then when they got the ball back after, I think making Ohio state go three and out, they, um, they scored on the next drive after that. So they went up seven, nothing early. All the Ohio State fans are are up in arms, and then Ohio State rips off 31 unanswered points, which is the same thing that happened in this mm-hmm. game. Um, granted, we didn't have a, uh, a punt return touchdown in that one, so I think there was a little bit more reason for enthusiasm uh, in, in this game, certainly against a higher quality opponent than there was in the Northwestern game. Uh, I think at the Northwestern game, there was a lot more frustration. We talked a lot last week about how the vibes going in were just generally bad. And then the start of the game just kind of only poured gasoline on that fire. I mean, it was, Uh, I would say that here's what I would say. Northwestern is definitely not the same team as Indiana. Indiana is a much better team than Northwestern, but you can also see that the level of attention and give a damn that Ohio state had going into Northwestern game, very different. Much more then, prepared, much more well prepared. Yes, yes, yeah, one hundred percent. So yeah. I think that factors into it as well. But then the other, the other game that this game reminded me of, just strictly speaking, in terms of the performance of the offensive line, was the Nebraska game, hmm. which that game was tighter than it needed to be, largely because Ohio State did not throw the ball as many times as they needed to. I believe that is the only game this year in which Will Howard has not attempted at least 20 passes, which for a guy that now in six of his 11 starts has completed 80% or more of his throws is that's one of the most surprising unacceptable. Yeah. That's one of the most surprising stats to me actually this year out of Ohio state, how accurate he's been like, he was never an accurate passer. And, and the, you know, some of it's the guys he's throwing to, but like he's making the throws like he's doing, like he has taken a step at, at this part in his, uh, you know, college career. I think it's pretty wild that he's gotten this much better in terms of accuracy they, uh, where you have done four good... years of, you know, previous, uh, you know, evidence to show that he's just not an accurate guy. And that's not been the case this year. He's been great. The they've done a good job of giving him throws that he can make. And obviously he's playing around more talent than he ever mm-hmm. has presumably in his, in the rest of his college career. But at the same time, I, I mean, one of the most not really dwelt on moments of the game that I thought was extremely pivotal, even though it ultimately resulted in zero points for Ohio state was, third down and 35 well <laughs> yeah Howard we got to talk about that we, we're going to move on yards. to some of the other stuff but we have to talk about that fourth yeah. down and 10 it, it was so funny even looking at that fourth down and 10 i'm like they right ryan day's going for this 100 percent. right like after you just got that it's like you that gives you a huge momentum boost and they're kind of in no man's land it's like yeah why wouldn't you just go for it screw it when you're already down and they picked that up too throwing to the exact same guy i mean I, I would not have guessed that Will Howard would have been able to do something like that at the outset of the season. And I I, I brought it up after the game. I was like, can you imagine Kyle McCord trying to convert that third oh and 35? God. Like what, what kind of disaster would have taken place? Well, and the thing is Howard is had that... to extend the play on the third down in order to even get in a position to make that. Exactly. Play. And not only that, but he had to deal with like pressure in his face and, you know, hang on to the ball, throw it the last minute, take the hit. That is not something I think you could expect Kyle McCord to do, at least last season. 
Um, and I think that really does kind of show the difference between the two guys, but yeah, that was hilarious. You're, the, you're, you're in this comedy of errors. You get called for these ticky tack kind of penalties, which were probably, I mean, probably fair. I'm not saying like the refs were like, you know, super terrible in this game, but like, you know, you just shoot yourself in the foot and it's frustrating and stupid. And you're like, Oh my God, this team is not getting it going. Is this going to, you know, turn into, you know, something really weird. And then they pulled that out. They didn't get any even points on that, on that drive. And it didn't matter because after that, I was like, well, that's it. Game over because there's nothing Indiana can do. If you can't stop a team on third and 35, you're not going to win the game. If you are incapable of stopping them, you're going to lose. And that's yeah. after that, I was like, that's it. And, and the thing is, you know, Ryan Day, I feel like has spent so much try, time trying to cultivate this, this attitude, this toughness within the team, right? And and give examples of that to the media. And, you know, most notably, you know, against Notre Dame when they, you know, punched it in and won the game. And he's like, yeah, this is a tough team, blah, blah, blah. And we all made, you know, laughed about it, made fun of it, whatever. But that's the kind of thing that Ryan Day, I think, has been looking for. That That's not something that you can do. Um, you can't manufacture those moments. It just has to happen organically. Like your team has to be, they have to have that amount of dog in them. You know what I mean? <laughs> Like you can't make that happen. I, I just hate has that to cliche, but I know, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah, but that's what I'm saying, right? Like that's that's something that doesn't happen. You can't manufacture it. It has to happen organically, yeah. and it did. And after that, I was like, game over. Like there's no chance in hell that Indiana's winning this. So, but I, the what reminded me more of the Nebraska game than the fact that I mean, because that was that was the key difference. I think that why you know the Nebraska game was probably the biggest letdown performance this team has had all year. Even mm -hmm. I, I even count the Oregon game in saying that because the Oregon game, they were, you know, underdogs. They were, I think they were under uh, line bounced back and forth, but that game was projected to be close and they lost by one point or whatever. Nebraska, they were favored by almost the same amount that they're favored over Michigan. They're favored by over three touchdowns and they only end up winning 21 17. And they very nearly let nebraska come back to win it at the end even mm -hmm. and the big comparison for me in that game relative to this one was that was the first game after they lost josh simmons and they're trying to address this big loss on the offensive line right. and they're just not figuring it out they run with zen mikowski at left tackle that ends up being a totally enormous disaster which might speak to part of the reason in the same way where signetti was like every time we drop back to pass something bad was happening that's kind of a similar thing to what was happening with zen mikowski at left tackle uh in that nebraska game mm -hmm. which given how he played under shorter like notice circumstances in the oregon game was kind of surprising but mikowski ends up getting injured Next game against Penn State, they got to slide Donovan Jackson over, and they end up figuring it out over the course of two weeks. But that first week where they're trying to figure out how what life after Josh Simmons is going to look like, you know, there's there's some bumps in the road. Similar situation here. It's incredible. I mean, we we recorded the Dubcast last week, Monday night, and we give all of our takes. I've already submitted my scoring prediction the next day to Andy for the Indiana game, and then. Rumors start swirling, I believe, Tuesday night that Seth McLaughlin has torn his Achilles, and we're hoping that it's not true, but then before the evening is over, it ends up being confirmed by the dispatch that it is. Now they're in a situation where they're trying to replace their, you know, I, I think most people would say Simmons. If, if McLaughlin, it, like, there's a lot of people that would say McLaughlin was the best lineman they've had this year it was between him and Simmons before the two of them got hurt yeah. so you're now in a position where you're trying to replace your second if not your most effective performing offensive lineman after already losing the other person that would have qualified for such distinction and based on the pattern that we saw earlier the first time it happened you you think there's going to be some turbulence involved and based on the observations of neutral onlookers which is me being very kind to PFF and saying that, that <laughs> their, yeah. their judgment was that it was not great. And to their point, I mean, you, when I, when I first brought the attention to everyone on staff of what the PFF grades were earlier today, the, the initial reaction from many people, including yourself was, was very harsh. I believe you said, quote, uh, PFF is ass <laughs> with the, 
with the Meryl Streep yelling yeah, at yeah, the yeah. Oscars. Which I still believe, whatever. by the way. I, I still very much believe that. I can under like it's let me quick aside. All right. And and we do have to move on because we got a lot of stuff to talk about. And we want to get into Michigan. But I, I want to say this talk about the end of the game. <laughs> well, yeah, we can do that. We have to do that briefly. We because we we cannot shortchange right. our Michigan stuff. But I will say this just real briefly. Uh, they gave everybody like 50, 60 grades, I guess, which I don't know what the hell that's supposed to mean anyway. Like, oh, 50.34, I see. Okay, well, that helps. Anyway, um, they gave them like high 70s in pass blocking, but they're like, oh, but your run blocking was so bad. It's like then <laughs> they <laughs> Ohio State threw the ball 26 times against Indiana. Will Howard had a clean sheet, like like he he was his jersey was kept clean. He was fine. I don't I don't know. I think they perform better than what PFF says. Well, I understand I, about the run blocking, but like a lot of that's assignment based. And when you're trying to like revamp your offensive line for the second time in the single season, um, that's going to happen. So I just I think it's a little harsh and a little. Well, silly. I think I think Dan was the one that astutely pointed out if you don't have that garbage time Travion run at the end of the game. Ohio yeah. State averages less than three yards per carry. Sure. For yeah, and that's afternoon. not good. I'm Which, not saying it's good at all, but by the standard you've previously established on this show is absolutely horrible. If I yeah. I am of the belief that you get over you get three point four, you're getting a first down <laughs> on average if you hand the ball off three times. There I'm go. good with that. All right, you, let's do anything right. in the threes or lower, you're Oh yeah, no, fire him into the sun. So real quick, let's do the ending stuff. So Trayvon Henderson gets that. He slides at the one. I don't know why he did that. There was no reason. Like, because he is selfless and <laughs> and was trying to safeguard my scoring prediction. I clearly, as well as that yeah. of Jones and Jordan Rain. That's right. Okay. So he slides and then Ohio State lines up and they're like, nah, we're gonna go ahead and score anyway. And so they do. I don't think anyone has a lot of sympathy for Indiana just because, I mean, this is a team that has run up the score on multiple teams so far this season. I, I, don't, Cignetti, think that matters. I don't think Signetti was all that upset either. Honestly, like after the game, you can see them handshake and Signetti basically says like, you know, you guys did good or you beat the crap out of us or whatever. Like he's not, he's certainly not angry about it. He, uh, but he you pointed out that he made his own bed. Yeah, of course. His comments, of course. Which I, I very much appreciate that he didn't, you know, there no. wasn't, uh, there wasn't he what about ism. He, he no, understood no, no. what the risk that he took exactly. and he was willing to live with it. Yes. I and I appreciate that. that. I respect it. it. I, I think he handled it the right way. He talked his, you know, he talked his talk. And then after the game, he was like, Hey, props to them. And that's how you do it. That's how you handle it. I think when you're the head coach of Indiana, you got to have some swagger, but you also have to, you know, also kind of admit that you're the head coach of Indiana. That's I did. I did think they owned in on the Google stuff a little too much, you know, cause he wasn't really taught. He was more building himself up than talking right, about right. Ohio state when he right. made those comments. Yeah, no, he was talking about Ohio state when he said that they suck, but that's, yeah. that's <laughs> all right. But you had a point about the ending of the game that I thought was interesting. Cause I hadn't thought about that. So what yeah. did you see? Okay. So just there, there's been a lot of, as we've kind of alluded to Ari, there's been a lot of controversy about how the game ended, particularly from the, uh, the, the Bloomington and the Indianapolis and the Indiana media were yeah. very up in arms about the way about the, the classiness of how the game ended. That's right. Will, yeah. Which was a bit hypocritical given what Johnny brought up with not only Indiana running up the score, but then also comments that Signetti had made about Ohio State, you know, mm -hmm. going back to when he had been first hired and whatever. Right. I I don't have a problem in in principle, in theory, with what they did at the end of the game, especially because I don't think they would have actually been trying to score in that situation if Travion hadn't ripped off that huge run after the onside kick. No, they th they thought they were just going to be running up the middle until the clock ran out. Now I just to dissuade any accusations of bias, I did predict 31 17. So <laughs> them, them scoring that touchdown at the end ruined the scoring <laughs> prediction. But as I alluded to earlier, I shared with, uh, but Jordan, you're, you're certainly aren't, you're Jones. not angry about it. You're not, you hold, no I, I was, I was furious. <laughs> like that was, that was the 11 warriors version of bad beats. What happened in that situation? So I had, we were already being celebrated by other people at the site for our our 
Nostradamus. They like, ruined oracleism. it. Yeah, exactly. And then that ended up spoiling right. it. And, and so, but this isn't part Christus. of that. This isn't why well, you're bringing this it, up. It's a part of it in the sense that what I'm about to say, I don't want people to say, oh, you're, you're just against what happened because, right. you know, it ruined your prediction for the game. And you know what? I'm going into the last week. I'm second overall in the site standing. So there I feel go. pretty good about how things turned out like anyway. 13. Dubcast still knows ball. Well, My problem with what happened at the end of the game, and I don't think enough people, I don't think Ohio State people are being as uh, as receptive to this as they should be, and I don't think that generally this point is being made enough among football onlookers. Mm-hmm. They ran those two plays on the goal line out of victory formation, which is not – that is a formation that is reserved for taking a knee and nothing else. Right. It is sacrilegious to the game to do anything else in that situation. And to and it's it's one if you're gonna do it, you better score on the first play. And they did. <laughs> then they ran yeah, they another did, one out of victory. Hey, right. it, it, which is like, okay, your your facade has already been blown. Like you're right. really gonna try to do it again. And then they got in and they got rewarded for it. And then they, you know. Howard did the whole, you know, I, that's yeah. not how you hold a cigarette. Yeah, not, yeah he did like, I, this is what not, I think a cigarette is. Yeah, then. not that I smoke cigarettes, but to my right. knowledge, that's for, you know, holding another type of uh, uh, of rolled paper, if you will. But I, uh, I, victory formation is not something that you should be trying to score out of. And sure. if you believe in the football gods and good and bad karma, I believe what Ryan Day did is at some point going to come back to bite Ohio State in the butt. I am not okay with that. If you want to go T formation, goal line, Maryland eye, what have you. Which they the did do earlier in the game, and it yeah. worked out. Yeah, if you want to do something out of that formation and or just run a sneak and get in, that's fine. But to go victory formation and then try to score in that situation, that is – that that is just bad optics and and bad juju that is yeah. welcoming that well, is tempting fate with the luckily for gods, me if you i don't believe deities. in karma because if it existed so many things else so other so many other things wouldn't so i i do not believe in that i think it'll be fine i sure hope it does because if it does there's karma coming headed towards ohio state's opponent this well we're gonna talk a lot of things we're gonna talk about right yeah we're gonna talk about that all right so real quick let's we'll we'll we're we're gonna do obviously the read and things like that we're let's do uh ask us anything before we do that i want to remind you that you can uh check out the dry goods store at 11warriors.com dry goods.11warriors.com shirts that stickers all kinds of stuff let's do ask us anything real quick very 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 brief rundown of the national scene and then we're gonna get into michigan um the first so by the way you can ask us questions uh to ask us anything by sending them to dubcast at 11 warriors.com um uh this is from kevin first one in your opinion is what sammy sasso just did the most amazing sports story that we've heard all year i would say coming back from uh you know obviously the the gunshot wound that he you know sustained i mean that's a pretty unbelievable story i I absolutely agree that people need to be talking about that and acknowledging that um but it's wild to me that it's like not even what it's it's the like how many years has it been since we saw the same kind of thing from a football player (laughs) like is it i mean i don't know the the dedication of these guys uh and their ability to get um uh, to get back on the field, get back in their their game is is pretty unbelievable. I I yeah, I can't imagine. Well, there's a there's a couple NFL players that did something similar this season. I believe I don't know if it was this season that Brian Robinson, the running back for the Commanders, had a similar thing happen where he got shot. That might have been last season, or it might have been this. But I know that uh, Ricky Pearsall, who was the first round draft pick for the uh, the San Francisco 49ers, was uh, I believe in a got shot in a robbery attempt and that delayed his um, debut for the 49ers going into this yeah. season. And he finally took the field a couple of weeks ago, but obviously those guys aren't Ohio state football players. So I think, I don't know about most amazing thing like in sports period, just because it is uh, it's something that has happened for athletes in, in a lot of, maybe not a lot of different practices, but at least lots of different, I don't even know about lots. 
it's it's something that is not unique to Sasso himself, but right. in terms of Ohio State athletes, it is certainly one of the most feel good stories that he has made it back from a tragedy like that uh, of the year. I think yeah, that him and him and Haskell Garrett coming back from something like that is pretty oh, yeah. unbelievable. So yeah. I yeah, my I salute to both of those guys, and I think it is pretty freaking incredible. Um, this one's from our good friend Alvin who says, RIP Jasper. I poured one for the feline. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I don't know why I'm like laughing about it. I should have told some, but I don't know. Some of my coworkers were like, wait a minute, your cat died? You didn't say anything about it? I was like, I, you, I mean, I didn't have a wake. I mean, it's sorry. A cat. <laughs> yeah. No, he's a great cat. He's a great cat. An RIP, and I appreciate the. We thoughts. all have our own grieving process. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Mine is ask us anything. Uh, Alvin wants to know. Uh, coffee or tea? I hate coffee. I think it tastes like butt. Um, I love to, well, I don't love tea, but I really like it. I enjoy it. I'm not like some kind of tea connoisseur, but I, you know, that's, that's my, uh, hot drink of choice is, is tea. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good like tea places in a place like Columbus. You can get, you know, a lot of those like fancy, you know, specialized ones in a bag. I'll get those occasionally, but most of the time I just get like, you know, I throw a tea bag in the uh, a cup and fill it with hot water and drink it and enjoy it. That's that's how I roll. I don't put anything in. I don't put any like I'm lactose intolerant, but I don't put any milk or cream or sugar in tea either. I just I just drink it as is. I, I have to be careful what I say here because you know tea's a particularly sweet tea is a big cultural thing down here in the oh, south. Sure. No, I don't. I don't. I don't south go for the Carolina. iced tea or the sweet tea. Well, I so I have to. You know, I got to look over my shoulder. Yeah, that's in case, right. you know, Somebody comes out of the walls. To, yeah, and just you know, screams. You know, bless your heart at you, and then runs right, away. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I probably just say coffee by default. I tried when I was in Hong Kong, uh, doing my first internship through Fisher College of Business, like ten years ago. Mm-hmm. I tried to like get into drinking tea more just because it was a big you know practice yeah, it's part of the culture Chinese yeah. culture yeah and it I just couldn't get to it man like i tried making like green tea and stuff and it just i i was never really able to get tea i tried i tried different kinds of tea and i was just yeah. like this is never really it for like i and i would much rather have iced tea than hot tea also mm. whereas with coffee i can i i can take it either way like I, I i i enjoy both of them so i would i'd have to just go with coffee um, but I also say that recognizing that I've inflicted a caffeine dependency upon myself, and, you know, <laughs> I actually think going to satisfy that, you know what? And I wasn't a big tea drinker until I lived in Japan and, um, it definitely took a few months to stick. Like I, and, and the thing is, is that, you know, I worked in a bunch of different, um, middle schools and stuff. And, uh, it's just kind of, a you know, like a, a normalized thing to have a, uh, either a pot of, green tea or and it either chilled or hot depending on the time of the year um that people would just drink like they would like a normal like water fountain kind of drink you know what i mean like like just getting some water um and that was totally normalized in pretty much every office environment that i was in at all and i was in a lot of different ones but there was one school where i was teaching at uh where one of my co-teachers who was japanese she was a native japanese uh you know person she i think had this kind of impression that all americans really really love coffee and so she would put like very sweet of her she was very nice she would put a uh cup of coffee on my desk every morning that i was there and then kind of wait patiently and watch me drink it and i I, again do not like coffee at all (laughs) but i couldn't like like the first couple times i didn't say anything and she kept doing it i couldn't tell her you know, after the third or fourth time, like, hey, quit giving me this disgusting bean water. So I would just have to like chug it down, like, mm-hmm, yeah, it's delicious, and then you know, feel like crap the rest. She of the was day. conditioning you. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, but um, it was very, it was very nice. But I was like, I'm just gonna drink the green tea. So uh, next one here, this is from Joshua F. What is the pettiest complaint you have about Buckeye fans? <laughs> oh, oh, Joshua, I have so anyway. He's, he goes on, he says, as a former band member, congratulations, by the way, that's cool. Uh, it still annoys me that fans do a different chant than the band does during Buckeye Battle Cry. During Script Ohio, when the band is singing the fight song at the end, uh, after they say, we have to win this game today, the band chants, come on, Ohio, come on, Ohio, in two snappy syllables, the official version of my mind, while the rest of the stadium would simultaneously chant the traditional 
Ohio in three syllables. <laughs> I can understand. Look, hey, if you're a highly trained marching band musician, complaint. I can see why that would be very annoying. So he says it's a silly, petty complaint, but you think somebody at some point would pick on uh, up on how the band does it. Um, I've actually noticed that before. I think it's interesting. My pettiest complaint is that getting Ohio State fans to do anything is like hurting cats. And there's so many cool things that other fan bases do that kind of develop organically because everybody just kind of goes like, yeah, this is our thing. Let's do it. And like, as lame as it is in, in some respects, like I kind of think it's cool that Michigan fans sing Mr. Brightside. I think it's cool that Wisconsin fans all know the you know lyrics to build me up buttercup and sing that, you know, and then do jump around. That's not something that can happen at Ohio state because we're such an unruly mob like as such an unruly Mongol horde of, of people that even getting one simple thing accomplished is seemingly an impossibility. And so when they had the blackout game for the first time against Indiana, I was like, there's no way in hell this is going to work. Like nobody's going to listen. Nobody cares. They're just going to go and scream and yell and then we'll be done. But everybody did. Everybody showed up in black. And I was like, this is incredible. More of that. And then that's like the only time that ever worked really that successfully. So I want to see more of that. I, I'm sad that there isn't more organic fandom out of Ohio State fans. And it's just such a big, huge, crazy mess, which I do like in some respects. But, you know, I wish there was more cohesiveness when it came to that. This is going to sound very elitist. <laughs> okay. But I have noticed, and granted, I've been to more game college football games. and all, The only other field or the only other – uh, stadium that I think I possibly have been to more games at in my life than Ohio stadium is the former Ryan field. Mm -hmm. Cause I grew up in Chicago. Sure. Um, but I have to say that at least among Ohio state fans that I've observed, there is a greater practice of fans trying to identify unsold seats and and moving down into those seats so you don't you don't like that their practice. position i well i had a very very unpleasant experience where i i like the year after i graduated i had uh you know i i was going to see i i can't remember who they were playing um but it was like a cold rainy day Mm -hmm. And uh, I had gotten a ticket for one of my friends that was my roommate in college. And of course, he's he's the type of person that like wouldn't go to the game if he got if he just went too hard at the pregame. Sure. Yeah. And so there was me inviting him to the game, understanding that there was a bit of risk that he might just not make it. Yeah, just like. Yeah. And that ended up being exactly what happened. <laughs> So I have this seat and it's like right under the underhang and oh, I'm still holding out hope that, you know, maybe my friend is good. And this, you know, I, I've used the term crispy critter before <laughs> these, these two crispy critters that yeah. are, that don't want to be out in the rain or whatever are, are scoping out spots where they could sit. And so we'll, these two guys come over to this spot that I've paid for that mm -hmm. I have a ticket for and they try to invade it. And I tell them like, I, I know this isn't your ticket. Like I literally paid for this seat. You can't be here No. And they were like, well, when your friend comes or whatever, we'll leave. And I'm like, all right, I'm not going to make a whole fuss about this to like security and whatever. Cause I actually don't know if my friend is going to show up with his ticket or not, but it never happened. And so I had to, for the rest of the time I was at the game, it was just an unpleasant and awkward experience for me because I had already told these people off. And it's well, see, like, that's the I, thing you got. You got to just go with the no, flow. No, but man. you know I'm, what? I'm 100% they, they knew. They knew they were in the wrong. Oh, of and course. And I called them out on it, and yeah, they yeah, just yeah. blatantly did not care. Yeah, because I they were either. like, "Oh, I got to be honest, George. I'm I'm in support that's of, why I of said, that practice." No. Yeah. No. You don't sit, show up. Sit in the seat that you paid for. Nah. No. Nah. Sit wherever you want. And here's what I say. The the thing you, is, is you that you Middletown plebeian. <laughs> that's right. That's right. No, that's that's the part of the. That's the why Mongol I said it's going to sound elitist. Like, no, well, it definitely sounds I, elitist, but that's okay. My what I would say though is that if you have a situation where you're paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars to go to a game and it's raining and it's crappy 
and you're like, man, I can just go up like three, go up three rows. I, who cares? I like, it doesn't matter to me. I'm already in my seat. I don't give a crap. I think everybody should be encouraged to go as close to the field as they possibly can when there isn't uh, a packed house. I think that's, that's the way stadium should do it. I don't think I understand why they don't, but um, no, I think people should have the best view. No, because you know what, if everybody adopted that mindset, I mean, we wouldn't have like a, it would be total chaos at these games. That's what I want. No, that's what I want, George. It's horrible. And I've seen that. I have not noticed that practice being implemented in a lot of the other stadiums that I've been to. Like it was, it's more at Ohio stadium that I've noticed that. And I've seen people that like get called out by security and then have to get removed from those seats because they were trying to, it's not just Just me having one unpleasant experience. I'm just saying, just be chill. It's people Uh, that try to fill in that gap. And then the people with the tickets actually show up and then they get tossed. I've seen it happen several times at Ohio stadium. I know. But that's the risk you take. It's fine. Uh, next one here. This is from Mac Ingram. He says, uh, the week is finally here. This isn't a question so much as a statement. The week is finally here. Been waiting all year to stop waiting four years. Underwood got the bag, but none to worry, Buckeye Nation. C.J. Stroud never beat that team up north, and he'll meet 60 minutes. Wait. Okay, well, Underwood is <laughs> he'll meet 60 minutes of the Buckeyes soon enough. Okay, Underwood's not on campus yet. This is a kick him while they're down game, and that's exactly what they blanking deserve. Uh, Bucks by a billion, blank Michigan, kill the blank, <laughs> and kill them again right after. Uh, sure uh, and then he sent so. a picture of his adorable child, which I'm not going to put on the internet, but <laughs> kind of in contrast with uh, the bloodlust that you exhibited, Mac. But I appreciate the I appreciate it. Uh, last one here. This is from Jen. Happy Thanksgiving and happy hate week, guys. Uh, first off, condolences to Johnny for the loss of Jasper. Destructive or not, I'm sure he was a cool dude. He was a cool dude. The best thing about that cat is that he was, for all his incredibly irritating and destructive tendencies, one of the sweetest, nicest cats you'll ever, like, never bit anybody, never even growled at anybody. He liked dogs. He was always curious about dogs and other animals. Like, I don't know. Just a very, very, very chill cat. So I... As someone who's not inherently a cat lover, I thought he was a great cat. So R.I.P. Um, I'm sure he's up there just bugging the hell out of St. Peter, <laughs> scratching on the vestments. And, you know, anyway, on the topic of Thanksgiving, what are your favorite and least favorite side dishes? Um, I swear we were asked this question a year ago. We might have been. I feel I, like I would, we you know, I mean, it's Thanksgiving. I, I feel like, you know, we can talk about it very briefly. We we have a little bit of time. Uh, favorite, I mean, mac and cheese goes well with everything. I think that's, that's kind of a classic. Yeah, that's my answer. Um, I'm getting ready to make that Thursday. At oh, that's right. You were telling me about your, your sicko yeah. mac and cheese. It's not sicko. No, well, that, I mean the, that in a good way, like Travis Scott sicko. I know you probably make the MF Doom mac and cheese. <laughs> that's, or whatever right. That, that's right. That ridiculous <laughs> recipe is. That's right. I don't think it's as good as the one I make that I stole from Yo, the... De La Soul on it. Yeah, uh, three, I, the one, no, the no, the one I make three layers one high that, and rising. So the mac one and that cheese. the company that caters the Kentucky Derby serves. That's so right. That's right. Very, that's it's right. Very, very good. And Forgot it's more basic than you would think. That's that's the beauty of the recipe. Is that's its simplicity. Um, and I really like stuffing. I'm a big stuffing guy. I like mashed potatoes. My dad makes um uh, uh dumplings, uh, and he's they're they're pretty good. Um, I, I enjoy that Thanksgiving quite a bit. dumplings. Yeah, yeah, chicken dumplings. Yeah. yeah. I think they're pretty good they're not turkey um, dumplings yeah basically like he uses part oh they of it are and, yeah, oh, yeah yeah okay yeah no it's that's, it's, that's it's pretty cool. good yeah um least favorite i don't know i mean i'll eat i'm not a picky guy i'll eat pretty much anything but i i don't like i don't like the of kind the of st- it's it's super high up there yeah i really like thanksgiving um i don't know they're really <sighs> sometimes people get like a little too fancy pants with their, with their Thanksgiving stuff. Like, Hey, let's put, you know, like, I don't know, like scala like scallops in our, our uh, stuffing or some goofy crap. And I'm like, just, just keep it simple. When it gets too complicated and too weird, that's, that's when I kind of tap out. Um, you don't have to be crazy with Thanksgiving. It's, it's not about 
how intricate the food is. It's about the quantity of the food that you are eating throughout right. the course of a single day. So I just, I don't like it when it gets a little too cute, but other than that, I'll eat pretty much anything, honestly. Yeah. No, Do I you mean, have mac, it? And, mac and cheese is the go-to, as I said, All right. uh, I don't, there's not too many, there's, I, I, I do shy away from more, like, I'm not a big cranberry guy. No, yeah. Like, I don't, I don't really do any of the cranberry uh, fine. kind of dishes. That's that for um, me, that's kind of hit or miss. Um, yeah. But I, I, I know I some people that. are very big on like literally the ones that just like come out of the can or oh, whatever, yeah, like know, that, yeah. that, that, that that's, canned that's mass. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is fine. Yeah. It tastes fine, but it's, it's not, I mean, it's raccoon food. Like, come on. Uh, <laughs> Which again, I'm from southwestern Ohio. I grew up on raccoon food. That's fine. I'll eat Geta. I'll eat Skyline. I know what it is. Um, you just kind of, you know, you got to go with it. Um, all right. So that's Ask Us Anything this week. Thank you for sending those in. We'll keep answering them. Real quick, around the uh, the national scene, the SEC got super stoked when they saw that Indiana lost. They're like, oh, let's show you guys how we do it down south. And then Auburn, <laughs> Auburn beat. Uh, Texas A&M, Florida skunked Ole Miss, and then Oklahoma slowly, lowly five and five Oklahoma just beat the absolute hell out of Alabama. Oh, so uh, Jalen Milrow, who for like a half a second was like, oh, Heisman. And then a week later was like, oh, he, never mind. I forgot he threw, a th- you know, he's going to throw three interceptions and lose his team in the game. So, um, I mean, some people like Alabama still got a shot, I guess. Uh, Cause they're Alabama and people are going to try to will them into this thing. But uh, it was really, really funny to see the sec's uh, biggest college football playoff, you know, supplementary teams kind of fall flat on their face um, in a very short period of time. <laughs> uh, they, they looked, they were bad. They were really bad. Um, uh, it, it's I, the and amount, Indiana's still in it, which is great. The amount of it's, I, I feel bad for them because they're almost with the amount of, carrying water that ESPN has done for the SEC, the, the yeah. amount of apologizing that has been done on behalf of Georgia and Texas and now Alabama, especially, I mean, it, it, it almost certainly feels like that they're, the media is going to do everything that it can to put as many SEC teams in this thing as possible in right. spite of how the results have actually played out this season. Right. And really the only, I mean, the only evidence that the, these SEC teams, you know, deserve their spot in the first place was, you know, games against other SEC teams, which is the same argument you can make about any other conference team. And people have been talking about in, oh, well, they haven't played anybody. They've played all these, you know, crappy. Big well, and then teams. the other thing people will point to, too, is they're like, oh, all the NFL scouts say that the best talent comes out of the SEC. <laughs> Fine. So. But if the coaching is ass, who cares? And if their quarterbacks are going to throw three interceptions a game, that doesn't really, it's not going to really matter at all. Like, that's the thing. I mean, I don't know, man. Like, I watched that Alabama Oklahoma game and I was not like overwhelmed by the talent on the field from either team. This was not a situation where these two teams were two Titans going at it, right? Where it's like, oh man, just throwing haymakers. They, they have clear deficiencies where they are not good at a very important things. Um, that pick six that Jalen Milrow oh threw God. was one of the most embarrassing I've ever seen in the it was sense terrible. that he had an opportunity to tackle the guy and got stutter stepped. Yeah. Like into his own. So like if you, it was a terrible I, throw, he got embarrassed at the end of it. I, mean, I think it was awful. I think this happened in the bowl game before the year he won the Heisman. But I was thinking about when Joe Burrow threw a pick six in his bowl game. And I believe that in trying to go make the, do you remember this? He, he tried to go put himself in a position to make the tackle. And one of the defensive linemen on the other team, just like, I, I like decleated him like absolutely. <laughs> I actually like, think I do remember so, that. Yeah. It was so bad, but then he ended up winning the game for LSU. Like right. he had a bounce back before you. Right. Cause you he's really see, good. Well, not only that, but you want to see the moxie of your quarterback that right. they're, to they're forget not that afra- kind of thing. Right. They're not afraid to go try to rectify that error right after the main Milrow, because he wasn't willing to sell out for the tackle got, stutter stepped by yeah. a, a defensive back 
Yeah. Not an offensive player, not someone who's used to taking reps with the ball, but a defensive back. Like yeah. that's wholly embarrassing. And I I'll admit they got screwed over in that game by probably the worst call I've ever seen in, it, in any football game. It was that, very bad, but they were losing Ryan, that game regardless. That they, was not... they were, but in, in a moment where you're trying to get any sort of grasping of momentum, you get that big play from Ryan Williams on what would have been a phenomenal catch if it had stood. Yeah. It's suddenly only a two-score game, and you feel like you've got something to grasp onto. But when it gets taken away on a, a penalty that, frankly, just – made it it still defies logic there was no justification for it being called whatsoever and yeah. they can't even re- they don't even consider picking the flag up or reviewing it, it it baffles like i as much as i just admonished espn for carrying water for the sec <laughs> i don't blame the commentary team at all for throwing the officiating oh no no bus in that moment i actually the same crew that. by the way that did the georgia texas game which right. had its own right of uh, right. our own bout of infamous officiating yeah i actually encourage broadcast teams to do that more often because there's been a lot of like egregiously bad officiating in college football this season and i really think that needs to be like uh, highlighted more often a lot of missed of kind of face swallow. mask penalties yeah yeah um all right so let's get to michigan because we do have to talk about it and i think it's really important obviously that uh, we get into it a little bit because it is hate week and we hate them and I hate them, and they need- <laughs> It's not a strong enough word. <laughs> That's right. Um, here's the thing. In Michigan, for those of you who have been following, uh, they have not had a great season, right? This is, this is a team that is kind of limping into the game. Uh, they are the defending national champions, and they just now became bowl eligible uh, by really actually beating the absolute pants off of Northwestern, which is not something I think people expected. They put up 50. Uh, which is completely out of character for that team and, and kind of gives me pause going a little bit of pause going into. Um, and it's funny because a month ago we we ran with a topic during bye week that their program was suffering imminent collapse and that yeah. their fans were <laughs> panicking and dissociating, which they were during and after yeah, the they Illinois were. game. Yeah. Then they got $12 million to Bryce Underwood and suddenly they have something to cling to. Yeah. So I want to talk, I want to talk about a couple things here real quick. So first of all, well, I want to get into the, you know, the, the matchups in a second, but I do want to talk about some of those intangibles going into it. So, you know, there is a lot of stuff surrounding it. A lot of people have wondered, you know, what's going on with the notice of allegations, you know, hasn't Michigan exceeded the deadline for responding to them? Probably, I guess. I mean, I wrote an article saying I've I heard it was three Saturday. different deadlines proposed, including the one that yeah. you said was supposed to be Saturday. Right. Yeah, I don't know. And it's entirely possible that they did respond and that just hasn't been made public. I that's the thing. Like, no, but none of these parties are obligated to tell the public about what their negotiations are, what their responses are. That's not, you know, they there will be Freedom of Information Act requests that are filed, but that takes a while to process. And we may not find out about what really has gone down for months. It may be a long time, maybe, you know, January, February before some of this stuff comes to light. So my point with that, and kind of in addition to what I was saying in the threat level piece that I wrote, which is um, you can't rely on the NCAA to adjudicate any of this for you. Like the only, the only right and wrong in this rivalry is who wins the games. If Ohio state had beaten Michigan last year, yeah, that's it. The conversation's over, that's right? There is no so debate important for them to win. last. Exactly. Year. We there talked is about no that debate the show going into the game. That's right. There's no debate. There's no question about who was on the right side of history. It would have been Ohio State, and that's it. And then Michigan would have been the cheaty cheaters who didn't know what they were doing, blah, blah, blah. But because Michigan won, they get to write the narrative. And that's how it is with this. So if you're like, oh, man, I can't wait till the NCAA ban hammer comes down, I'm going to tell you straight up, that's not going to do it. Ohio State has to beat Michigan. If Ohio State does not somehow beat Michigan this Saturday, which I think they will, but if they lose, it's a different narrative. It doesn't matter what comes oh, out of if the NLA. They, if they lose, I mean, it is the narr- – They, I, I'm glad that you used or framed it that way because I think even – I'm not sure if I used this when we talk, we were talking about the game going in and then in the immediate aftermath a year ago, but it is true. It's I believe it is a Winston Churchill quote 
but it is commonly among people in my generation, at least attributed to call of duty, modern warfare (laughs) history is written by the winners. Right, Right. And so that why, that's why it was important for Ohio state to win last year. And they did not. And thankfully due to a lot of things that have come out after the fact, the narrative is now somewhat back in, in limbo in terms of what the legacy of not only last season, but Mm -hmm. the two seasons prior to that is going to be as it applies to Michigan football. However, what the defense has been for Michigan supporters, while all of this is going on has been, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. We were still better than you anyway. Right. The lions was off staff when we played you guys. And, and they get to say that now you. because they won. Well, it, you know, I I very much am of the mind that they're going to win, that Ohio State's going to win Saturday too. But to your point, if they lose, you know, in the way that the narrative has swung back into more neutral ground, regardless of what the punishment ends up being, if Ohio State does lose this game, the narrative is out of their control forever. Yeah. Like it, it, this is, this whole story is, is done. Yeah, absolutely. That history is rectified in the, in this result. It right. is, it is absolutely paramount. And I, can you, can you imagine what people are going to be saying about Ryan day? If he doesn't win this game? Oh my God. Yeah. There's an enormous amount of pressure on this guy to get it done. Um, I think, I mean, I will say that I think this is a team that's, I think their attitude is much more focused. I think it's a lot, it's a lot more business-like than it's been. I, they don't have the kind of nervous sweat that they seem to have a little bit last season. Like this is a team that seems very about their own business. And, and they don't they have a do. quarterback that doesn't practice what he preaches well, in terms of not making mistakes. I think I, well, more specifically, I think they have what they do have in Will Howard as a quarterback who really sets the tone for the rest of the team. Right. And he's a super confident guy, but he's also a really positive guy. And I think that actually really speaks volumes and, and allows the rest of the team to kind of like reflect that a little bit. And, you know, it's, it's, I think it's strange. I've always been kind of skeptical that one guy can make that much of a difference. Um, but in a football team, I think that that really is the case. On and, a, a quarterback when they're a yeah. the leader, a hundred percent. Yeah. And so I gen- think they're called field generals for a reason. Right. And so I think he has made a huge impact on the team in terms of that. Um, you know, if you're talking about matchups, I mean, Michigan this season, we've made a lot of hay about their inability to choose a quarterback. They have settled on Davis Warren and, you know, Davis Warren's got a great story and and how he came to that position, you know, as a preferred walk on and, you know, he had, you know, leukemia in high school and he lost his you know senior season because of COVID and all these other things. So he's overcome a lot of adversity. But we but, both also said that they never should they they were too hurt knee jerky in terms of yeah. benching him after the Texas game and that he was always going to be their best option and right. that's been kind of reflected in the results of their last couple of games where they've committed to him. But here's what's interesting to me about that. So against Northwestern, uh, Coles, it was a fairly tight game going into the half, uh, much like Ohio State and Indiana. Uh, Colson Leveling gets hurt. And they keep him out of the second half of Northwestern as a precautionary mm-hmm. thing. And, and you know, Sharon Moore has basically said that, you know, things are trending positively for him to play on Saturday. My guess is he will absolutely play on Saturday unless his, like, you know, leg is falling off. I can't imagine that he's going to be held out of that game. Um, but they're going to hold Will Johnson out, presumably. Well, he's... I think what he's dealing with is legitimate, like, can't play stuff. I don't... Some people say he's just quit on the team. I don't really believe that. But... My point is that in the second I half, I want to believe in that narrative. In my okay, but in my and my point is in the second half, Colson Leveland was out, and they started spreading the ball around a little bit, and that's not something that you had seen from Michigan pretty much all season, because it was okay. Is is Leveland open? No, check down, and that was it. And that was yeah. just a very basic. That was the only thing that they could run. All of a sudden, Northwestern, they're spreading it around a little bit now. They didn't get a lot of yards uh, through the air. And I think they averaged something like three and a half, four yards per attempt, which is really bad. Um, But it can be a functional offense if their running backs are getting going. And so I think their running backs tight. If the game script is tight too. Yeah, right. And I think their running backs. So Donovan Edwards and Kello Mullings against um, styles 
and Caleb Downs and uh, Cody Simon. That is really, to me, if you're going to look at one specific matchup that I think will decide the game in terms of uh, Michigan being able to stay, you know, pace with Ohio State, it's that. How are Ohio State's intermediate defenders, how are they handling the Michigan run game and preventing long runs, all that kind of stuff? And I'm not just saying that because Donovan Edwards has victimized Ohio State with, you know, several long runs in the past. I just don't think they can get anything done offensively if that part of their offense isn't working. Um, it all flows from that. It gives them the freedom to, to be a little bit more creative. Uh, as far as the defense goes for them, I mean, the one real worry that I have about this game is how uh, Michigan's defensive line is going to play against Ohio State's offensive line. Uh, they have three bona fide first-round players um, uh, on their defensive line. I mean, they they have some really, really talented guys. Mason Graham, in particular, has just been an absolute wrecking ball all season. Uh, he demands double teams pretty much wherever he's at, whenever he's you know unleashed. Uh, they're they're going to be a tough, tough defense. Uh, defensive line to handle. Um, I would say probably the best that they've played all season. And a Beyond tougher that, test, presumably, than Indiana was, which is why I made the comparison to what just happened in the right. Indiana game to the Nebraska, Nebraska game. Because right. they had a more difficult challenge on paper against Penn State the following week, and they had their most impressive performance of the season. Mm -hmm. I, Because of that trend, I am reasonably optimistic that we're going to see a similar – you know, now that they've had another week to figure out how to overcome the absence of one of their best players, that they're going to do something similar here right. in terms of giving a better performance now that they've had two weeks to figure it out against a more capable opponent than who they were trying to figure out against on one week. Well, notice. let me, okay. So let me ask you this. And I think you might have some interesting insight on this. If you're Ohio state, Okay, you know you've got this reworked offensive line. You know you're going against the best defensive line that you've played all season. What do you do? I mean, what what how do you attack a Michigan defense that has not great defensive backs, right? You've got linebackers that are generally solid against the run but not very good in coverage. How do you attack them? What do you do to try to give Will Howard a little bit of time? Like what's the best plan of attack for that? Well, I think that they've got to follow a similar game plan to what they did against Penn state, which mm -hmm. is, you know, kind of, it's not a great answer. I think just because, you know, obviously they only scored 20 points in that game, but again, that was a situation where they were trying to figure some things out on the offensive line. And uh, we were we were very complimentary of their play calling in that game because we were we didn't like that they didn't throw the ball enough or they didn't attempt as many um, they didn't attempt as many passes as they did like we talked about earlier. Nebraska was like the only game I think this year where they've they didn't have Will Howard throw the ball twenty times. I I think you have to keep it balanced, but the thing is it. it this is the interesting thing and the, what I they've been consistently doing um, in a lot of these games this season um, is that they, they kind of absorb the best blow from a lot of the teams that they've played recently very early on in the game. And then based on what they figure to be the best version of their opponent is in the early stages – they start tailoring and tweaking their approach to how can we mitigate that and right. overcome that and ultimately get this game back. That is something that they were not good at doing last year. And it was reflected in them going down early to Michigan and then never recapturing the lead again. I think mm -hmm. they might've tied the game at one point, but they never, they never let in the game last year. This year, and one of the things that you know gives me more confidence in Howard than it was in McCord was that I didn't trust McCord to play well under those circumstances where he was having to throw Ohio State back into the game, even though he did it you know against Notre Dame. But Notre Dame ended up not being uh, as good as many people expected them to be last year. They're a much more capable team this year, in spite mm -hmm. of the fact that they lost Northern Illinois. But they, um, this team 
so the most recent opponents, Nebraska, or not even Nebraska, Penn State, Purdue, Northwestern, and um, Indiana. Mm-hmm. In three of those four games, Ohio State was did not score the first points in the game. So they had to... They they had to recap. They had to equalize and then recapture the lead under all of those circumstances. So I trust them, even if they aren't the most effective version of themselves early on, to be able to figure out what's going to be the most effective way to beat the opponent based on whatever is coming out. I I do think, based on what we said at the beginning of this conversation, that almost all of the pressure is on Ohio state to win this game. Oh yeah. Even though it would be great to win if you're Michigan for what we talked about for, you know, keeping hold of the narrative purposes of the grander stuff that's going on relative to the, the NOA and the Stallion scandal. It's, it's still very much on Ohio state to right the wrongs of that and to make sure that this is a result for them, which could cause a little bit of tightness if they don't end up scoring the first points of this game as they haven't been able to do in three of their four most yeah. recent appearances. And I think, I think one of the biggest things for me is honestly, like I want to see the kind of play calling from Jim Knowles that we've seen in the past few games. Like you got to like blitz the hell out of these guys, right? Like you've been blitzing over 30, you know, 35% of the time, basically keep that up. Like you have to pressure get these guys. And it's not like, you know, Davis Warren isn't, um, you know, like Gabriel or anything like that. Like you, you're going to have the opportunities to kind of sit back a little bit and, and watch and make mistakes, but you know, keep up the pressure. Don't worry about, you know, maybe overrunning a play or something like you're, you're going to get it back on, you know, eventually, like this is not a team that will, uh, you know, prevent you from getting chances later on in the game. Um, and I want the same from Ryan day, like kind of to your point, like don't play tight. Like you got to let, you got to let it fly a little bit. And for me, man, I honestly think the tight ends are going to be a big deal in this game. And 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 they got they got Kazmarek back, but I think what you have to do, they're going to rely on their defensive line. You want to lean on Jelani Thurman to yeah, to yeah. Michigan. Michigan. yeah. <laughs> but no, but a little bit though, because the the truth of the matter is, is that there's only so many guys that you can cover, right? And you're going to get a lot, a lot of linebackers on tight ends like that that's just the way it's going to be because they do not have the dogs to to put you know they're not putting a linebacker they're not putting you know any of these guys Ernst Hausman they're not putting him on uh you know Emeko Buka you can't do that you can't do that so they're going to have to play a lot of like safe kind of coverages they're going to play a lot of quarters things like that that gives you the opportunity to do these little flare passes to uh Trayvon Henderson and some of these other guys and and we saw that um, at Northwestern, we saw that in, uh, you know, against Indiana, they have this pass, pass catching ability, except for maybe Jelani Thurman half the time, but that's fine. Uh, so I think you have to, I think you have to exploit that. And if you get Michigan in a position where they're like, oh crap, we've got to drop, you know, Jenkins or whoever, we got to drop these guys to try to like defend the pass. That's it. That's game. Uh, because then you just run it up the gut with, uh, Jenkins and Henderson and, and, you know, your score. Well, so I, I spoke in a lot of generalness in terms of answering your question. I didn't really provide a, a technical, um, you know, perspective, which I, I just to try to get a little bit more into that, to be more fair in answering your question. I did a lot of table setting on that to say, I, I, what I want primarily is for Ohio state to use the early stages of the game to figure out what they're going to be able to get away with. Mm. which might not happen right away because there's still unknowns, particularly with how the run game played against Indiana. Now you're getting a more formidable interior, Mm -hmm. uh, a set of defensive linemen that are going to be able to more capably control that line of scrimmage, figure out early on what you're going to be able to get away with, because if they're still able to give Judkins four yards fall forward every carry if they're able to give the ball to Trey 10 times and he's able to turn that into 70 yards on the ground then why would you not just lean into that and then supplement that with play action pass and RPO if you've got the the time to be able to execute those things then you want to lean into those to keep the defense as honest as possible in the event that they're having trouble running the ball 
through the A gaps and the B gaps and that the time for play action isn't there. I think that a big staple of the Chip Kelly offenses and schemes that we haven't really seen a lot of in recent games is screen passes to the, uh, you know, beyond the hashes to right. near the sideline. Right. And I think that if Ohio State does encounter turbulence in the middle of the field early on, we're going to end up seeing a lot of that because I trust Ohio State's receivers, regardless of whether they're in the slot and perhaps matched up against linebackers, as you're saying, is probably not going to be the case, or if they're out on out trying to play against a Michigan secondary that is presumably going to be missing its best member in Will Johnson. I trust Ohio State's talent at receiver to be able to make plays on the uh, wings of the offense uh, that end up beating Michigan's secondary for consistent yards. And then as you start to put more pressure on each side of the field and they have to start dedicating more personnel and attention to those areas, that is ideally going to open up things in the middle of the field where then you're able to get back to more of what Ohio State is going to need to be able to win this game. Right. So I best case scenario, you you just see what they're going to give you early on and they're able to run whatever they want in the event that they can't. There's some things they haven't put on film recently that we know are kind of a staple of their schemes traditionally that I think are going to be more prevalent in this game, particularly the screen passes. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm excited for it. I, I think Ohio State wins this. I think it's going to be a lot closer than maybe people are comfortable with um, because it is the game and sometimes just crazy stuff happen. Uh, but I think ultimately you're going to see that that losing streak end and it's going to be a huge moan of catharsis for you know Ryan Day and a lot of the guys who came back because I think that's, you know, they talk about winning national championship and everything, but it really starts with beating Michigan. I think that's I, it, it all comes down to how the game start. It, it just comes down to how quickly they're able to start. And they haven't started fast in pretty much any of their games the, in the last two months. Yeah. So you, I mean, you've been calling it a, a rock fight. I believe in terms of what you're expecting. I think that's I, yes. I don't think the whole game is going to be like that because their second half adjustments have been stellar in yeah. literally every game they've played this right. year to the point that I, except for the Nebraska game, but in literally every other game this year, they've played a better second half and they've absolutely destroyed teams in the third quarter in particular um, than you know they do in the first half. So I even if the first thirty minutes are a rock fight, I expect them to be able to separate themselves eventually. At three touchdowns does sound like a lot. I don't That's expect that to be the case if they don't start fast. But I will say, if they are able to get the first points on the board, if they're able to go up by multiple scores before the end of the first quarter. Uh, I think oh, they're watch gonna, out. Yeah. Uh, they're they're yeah. going to absolutely obliterate this team yeah. because Michigan is not a team that is equipped to play from behind. No. And, and it's I gonna think get, it's going to get ugly really I fast. think they'll and be super that demoralized. That is what I'm hoping happens more than Oh, 100%. You know, I think if that happens, I think Michigan will just be so mentally out of it. They'll they'll be looking at 25 and go, "Oh, Underwood, when's this guy going on?" This game and... will be tight until it's not. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I'm I'm down with that. And hopefully that's how it plays out because God knows they deserve it, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. So until next time, we will be hopefully celebrating a, a massive Ohio State victory over that team up north. Uh, but until then, I'm Johnny. I'm George. And we'll see you next time. Take care, folks.